According to the National Center for PTSD, about six of every 10 men and five of every 10 women experience at least one trauma in their lives. What exactly is PTSD and how can we prevent it? Those are just a few of the questions we hope to address today. Hello and welcome to Orton Outreach. I'm your host, Stacey Calloway. And today I'll be joined by Dennis Jones, president of Oakland County Crisis Response Organization, or OCRO, David Schwartz, director of Oakland University Counseling Center, and Karen Asaf, both of whom received OCRO services. Welcome, Dennis. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So tell me if you can um, start off with what exactly is PTSD? Well, the acronym is Post Traumatic Stress Disorder. And it's where someone faces a situation where mentally and emotionally they are totally overwhelmed. Uh, everyone reacts to it differently and reacts differently to different stimuluses that brings it back up, the situation that happened, that is. And talk to me about what is the mission of Okro? Oh, Okro is to step in at the very beginning after an event to try to normalize the emotions and the thoughts of what people have. Uh, a lot of people question themselves. Am I, am I going nuts? Should I be thinking this way? Shouldn't I? On and on. And they just run themselves ragged going around in a vicious cycle. We're there to do an emotional first aid and to get them back into a point where they can uh, function again uh, as the way they were. And you guys are um, a chain of support, right? And so how does that... Talk to me about the, the first steps, like how does that work in terms of if there is a traumatic situation that an individual or a group are going through? Talk to me about that. As to how we would approach them or? Exactly. How would you approach them? Like what's the, what are the steps? Okay, well, we've got one process for private citizen and we have another set of questions for professionals police, fire, along that line. Mm -hmm. So we'd first ask them, while well, we'd introduce ourselves, we'd talk about confidentiality, which is a high priority with us. What is said in the room that they're in stays there. Uh, we may discuss some reactions like that in amongst the group uh, within ourselves, but then that stays within ourselves. And that's more for uh, teaching and reaffirming within our own association. Mm -hmm. So we'd ask questions about first who we are, and then it would be five questions that we ask. Uh, what, what, who, who are you and what happened? Plain and simple. And that's all we want is just that. <clears throat> then it's, what was your first thought at the time of the incident? Then it's, if something could change, excluding the outcome, what would be that one thing you could change? Now, what we're doing is we're diving into an emotional bottom and we're letting them vent. Uh, during these questions, we could hear anything from quiet, peaceful tones to others that we've gone through that there's just a raging, not madness, but uh, frustration that is being let out. Uh, you have to be thick skinned because there could be a lot of swearing and that doesn't bother us because we know it has to come out okay so we let it come out then we ask okay we take what they say as to how it's affected them and we start talking about those issues that's the next part it goes from questions where we start to talk about their responses so we go from a baseline down into the emotional abyss. 
And then we start climbing back up with these symptoms that we observe. Then we start talking about how to take care of yourself, such as food, diet, uh, letting your spouses or family know you're having a rough time, mm -hmm. uh, talking with others, one thing after another. And then how can we re-enter back into the workplace? And all of that is done off of their responses. What are some of the symptoms that some people go through when, they're, when you guys are having these conversations? Shock, denial, grief, uh, anger, being mad. It can go from one end to another. It depends upon the situation. And do they often seek help from you or do their family members um, reach out to you? Uh, we're at the very beginning. Uh, we, When we're done, if they want to contact us, typically we'll call, we'll, con we'll talk with them. Yeah, get it right. We'll talk with them one time. Mm -hmm. After that, we, we're evaluating. Are they getting better? Are they getting worse? And that's to say, okay, you need help beyond us. We are not counselors. We don't have licenses or degrees. So we refer. So talk to me about that. How do people, what are the requirements to be a part of OCRO in terms of being a volunteer? Okay, you have to have a desire to work with people. That's one. Uh, it does help if you've gone through an incident. That way you know what you're talking about. But the big thing is we work, uh, everybody has the same training through the International Critical Incident Stress Foundation, ICISF, as far as either a, what they call a grand group, an individual class, or further back, they'd had one-on-one, uh, -on -one, small group, large group, you know, however they break it down, but you have to have a minimum of a group and one-on-one -on -one or an individual. Because we all work on that. Okay, and how long is the training? Well, if it's a combined class, it could be three days. If you do individual, it could be each one could be three days. And you are the president of Okro. How did this whole thing come about? Like how long have you been in existence? Well, I'll back it up to 1992 with the Royal Oak Post Office shooting and the term going postal. Mm -hmm came out of that. There are a few members on our team that were there as counselors uh, working with the post office personnel as well as fire and police and other post offices that were uh, concerned and distressed over what happened. So it was a large group and it went on for quite a long time and the counselors got together and said there's a need here this is an extreme but what about smaller incidents so they got together and they started putting down uh, the bylaws and within a year 93 they came out with the bylaws and they became incorporated. And how many members do you currently have? 40, I think it's 45, 48, right in that area. Okay. And so you started in 92 with the, um, the post office, you know, um, incident or what have you. What about the Oxford shooting? Um, were you guys called out to be a part of that to help? Yes. <laughs> Yes, that is one that I got the call. We had a problem 
with our uh, screening group. I'll leave it at that. I'm not going to name names. Okay. With our screening group as to where no one could reach them. So the officials at the county said to our liaison, who can we call? I got a phone call. And it was basically, you're it. So for the next three weeks, it was, I fielded all calls. So calls for help, calls for organization from the county, from fire chiefs, police chiefs, from our own personnel. Uh, I can tell you there was a day, yeah. There was a day where I got up and I plugged my phone in to charge it. And four hours later, I put it down. I had enough time to jump in a shower. And when I was drying off, it started ringing again. And I didn't put it down for another four or five hours. It can get a little hectic. Okay. But under the situation, I'll take it. How do you get through it? Like that was a pretty traumatic event. How do you get through all of that? Um, I can admit it uh, can be very touchy. There's days I can talk about it. There's days I have trouble. And there's days I don't even want to think about it. But I have to look at what gets me through it is it's not me. It's the people we helped. I mean, we had a call and the first call was Oxford fire needs diffusing. The people that were on duty before they leave, they need to be diffused. Okay. I sent that down to our on-call personnel person who said, put it out. I'm on my way. So I'm close. I was there within 25 minutes and I was the first one there. And we diffused, oh gosh, it was like 20, 28, 29 firefighters that night. And got them to speak and talk. And then we had also a time with them. Part of the diffusing is to let them know what kind of stuff they might be going through in the next 48 hours as far as emotions, thoughts, and to normalize them. You know, this is normal. You guys go through every day and you may see a stabbing, a, a victim of a car accident, one thing after another. You see that and you get thick skin. But one, this is kids. And some of them were their kids. So it hits a little closer to home. And then incidents like this also bring up past experiences. So that's what we call cumulative trauma. You didn't deal with it back then, you will now. And that brings up an additional amount of reactions and responses to their daily routine. Uh, I'm not going to say anything as far as some of the stuff they told us, that's part of the confidentiality, but some of the firefighters were conscious enough to go, something's wrong here. What is it? And they figured out what it was. Now I commend them. I commend them. And then once they figure it out, that takes, it's, it's like that takes that past trauma and it alleviates some of its effect as to now. Now I can work on this and move on. But this is something, no matter what you've gone through, 
you're never prepared for this happened in our backyard. It's always over there in another city, in another town, in another state, in another, but here, right. I called it that evil, walked up into your backyard. And for me personally, it ticked me off. Yeah, so to present that with them, um, they understand where you're coming from. You got to find a common ground. If you're talking to firefighters, police and like that, they're close knit groups. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a firefighter police background, they don't want to talk to you because you don't understand what they're doing. Well, I've got both of them. As a matter of fact, I served on a department just south of them. So I knew their equipment. I knew who their chief was. I knew their background. And I could break down those walls. It's like, I'm one of you. So they could open up. Uh, we also had another group that showed up that I wasn't aware of, which they've been starting out, which is firefighter to firefighter. And it's strictly peer driven. They showed up and it's like, okay, uh, where would you like us? And I said, out in the high bay, talk to them. When I'm done here, let them go out and talk to you. But this is diffusing, not debriefing. There's a difference. So they went out and did that. So all along, they were comforted in the fact that the people they were talking to had a background similar to theirs. That breaks down a lot of walls. And then the, the services that you do provide, it's not just to firefighters and police officers, it's also to um, individuals, right? Yes, we've, we, it started out with emergency services only. Okay. But then it has expanded over the years. Uh, gosh, I've been there 15, 16 years, and it's expanded to uh, businesses, to families, uh, large families, to uh, high-rise complexes i think my first call out was to a high-rise complex of uh, senior citizens okay. uh, incident happened and it's like okay we cover the gamut and is there a cost for your services no no we are totally uh free service everyone that is a member is, is doing it on their own dime now, if anyone wants to contribute, yeah, I'm not going to turn away. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it helps us with some of our costs. Okay. And how can people contribute? Do you have a, a specific number that they can call to either receive services or to make contributions? For making a contribution, that would be to mail it into our liaison. Okay. And we have a uh, banker through the county that it would get to them. And then that would uh, reflect on our bank account with them. Do you guys only provide services in the Michigan area? Like, is it only Oakland County or what other counties do you service? We service Oakland County, but we have agreements with other counties. And if another county was overwhelmed, I would have no problem with saying, let's go, we'll help you out. We had one incident a few years back that started in Oakland County. And we didn't know this going in. It started out Oakland County. Then it was after a few days, it was, well, we went to the original call out and it was, oh, can you stay a few days more? 
Yeah. So we got that set up. Oh, can you stay the rest of the week? And by the way, on this date, we're changing venues to downtown Detroit. Oh my gosh. <clears throat> that, uh, I was actually the call out coordinator on that. That put a whole new spin on everything because now you're going into Wayne County. So I contacted the Wayne County uh, coordinator. I said, hey, this is what's going on. Let them know. I says, do you have some people that can help us out down there? Sure, I'll put it out. It turned out we were with them for six days. We had, I'm pulling numbers off the top of my head from what I recall. It was like 93 people involved, over 400 man hours. Oh no, it was more than that. I think it was 900, over 900 man hours. Uh, it was, and it was massive and I had to keep track of it. It's like, how am I going to keep track of this? I had to come up with a spreadsheet okay. and put in who was where, when, how, and everything else. And then I would publish that back to the people as well as the people that we were serving. So they knew who was coming. And so how many man hours does it take? You know, and it probably depends on the, the situation, right? Yeah, that was an extreme. Okay. Mm -hmm. That was an extreme. Typically, I use one at uh, your cohort there. Uh, when I first met her, okay. it was a beginning of the year. It was a house fire and a family was literally destroyed in the house fire. She was the chaplain for the department. The department called us for a debriefing. Okay, I'm gonna explain the difference between diffusing and debriefing. I've used the two terms now. A diffusing is something that we go in and we talk to you before end of shift, before you have a chance to sleep. A debriefing is after you have a chance to sleep and to understand usually 48 to 72 hours after the incident to give you a chance to identify symptoms, sleep pattern changes, things like that. But we went into the department and had a fairly large debriefing and she asked if she could be present. Well, since she's their chaplain, I thought, okay, you had the, you had the wearing off with all to do a, a diffusing with them. Come on in and sit in on the debriefing so you know how to address things after that. Tip, that's not typical though. When I, when we got done with everything, I turned around to her, we got to have this woman on Okro. The things she's done, the, you know, this isn't normal, not just for a, a, any chaplain, so she's got some training. Oh well, yeah, she had the training. So we asked her on and she came on. But that was a, an incident that was very troubling. We had police, fire. And these are some of the old leather necks, you know, ah, that doesn't bother me. I, I, yeah, right. I've been there. Mm -hmm. I don't care what you say. It bothers you. Yeah, deep down, uh, there's, right. deep down there's something that bothers you. So yeah. what I would like to do right now is bring in a few people that Okro has helped, and you probably um, have personally helped them. I have um, 
David um, Schwartz coming in and also Karen Asaf. But before before I let you go, and I, you, we may even you know have you be a part of this, what are some other things that you'd like to add so that way if someone is going through something and they need services, maybe they're going through something or about to, where can they contact you to, to get um, some services, to get some help? Well, our contact is uh, Oakland County Security Dispatch, and that's at 248-858. 0931. They take the information, put it out to all of the board members who are the uh, on call coordinators, and then they call the one that's on call to make sure they got it. Okay. And then we get back in touch with them and go from there. Okay. Well, I want to personally thank you for what you do. I did see that you got uh, a bit emotional there and it's, it, you know, certainly understandable, certainly understandable for all that's, you know, that you've been through and all the years that you're doing that. So thank you so much for everything that you're doing. I know that you, you know, still have more to do because as you can see, there's a lot still going on in the world. So we do appreciate your services and uh, we'd like to bring a few people in just to, to talk to it and to let other people know that this is um, in Oakland County. You do service other areas as well. And just to let them know that this is this is here for people who may not know of it. So thank you so much again. Thank you. When we come back, we'll be joined with David Schwartz, who is the director of Oakland University Counseling Center and also receives services from Okra. Hello and welcome back to Orient Outreach. I'm your host, Stacey Calloway. And once again today, we're joined by Dennis Jones, who's the president of Oakland County Crisis Response Organization, better known as OCRO, and David Schwartz, director of Oakland University Counseling Center. Thank you so much for um, both of you for staying on and for joining us. Um, David, why don't you talk to me about your experience? What was your experience like with OCRO? Sure, yeah, there's, uh, I've been at OU, I'm going on my 16th year now, and I've had, uh, I've been lucky enough to interact with them, I think, at least three different occasions, there might have been more as well. I'll go back to way back when, uh, about 14 years ago, when I was still a relatively new staff member before I was uh, the director there. Uh, myself and another group, uh, group of, I think it was about 40 or 50 people at Oakland, we're all very lucky to be able to get uh, the two-day uh, uh, critical incident uh, debrief training that they offer, which was an amazing two-day experience. I still reflect on that, you know, 14 years later uh, in my work at OU. So that was my first interaction with the group, was actually going through that training, and it was a wonderful training. I recommend it for anybody who's interested in potentially being a volunteer to work with them, who has any interest in this field at all. Um, and then the, the second one was actually a very personal one. Um, myself and uh, my staff at the counseling center, we have a very small staff there for a university of our size. So we're a very tight knit group and we work very closely together and work very well together. And we had one particular year, I want to say about five years ago, where it was a very rough year for us as a team there, just because of a number of on-campus and off-campus tragedies that were happening that year. Um, just a lot of, unfortunately, for whatever reason that year, we had a lot of student deaths and faculty deaths and staff deaths that year as well. And as the main mental health uh, resource on campus, we really were out and about and working with students, faculty, staff a lot that year. And it really took, was starting to take a toll on us in terms of burnout and how we were being affected from that vicarious trauma that people in my profession can experience. And I remember I reached out to Oak Row and decided uh, to actually have them come in and do a debriefing session with myself and my staff. And I still contend to this day, five years later, that that was honestly one of, if not the best decision I've ever made in my career at Oakland University. Um, it really gave my staff a unbelievable chance to be able to feel vulnerable, open up, talk about what we were feeling. And the positive impacts of it were almost immediate. Like, I'm not exaggerating, by the next day, I saw people being more recharged, re-energized, you know, more sharing with each other, I think, and being open with each other about some of the struggles we were going through that year, too. Um, but like I said, I still honestly look back on that, and that's one of the best decisions I've ever made as a director at the Counseling Center there at OU. So, um, And then my most uh, recent experience, and I think we might have even had a couple, but we've had we've reached out to Oak Row a couple times since then now when we've had on-campus tragedies. 
particularly the type of on-campus tragedies that are really impacting a wider number of students. Uh, most recently was just this past year, we unfortunately had a student uh, who passed away and the student was very well liked, very involved, and it was affecting both uh, a large uh, number of students in a very tight-knit program that the student was involved in, and also the faculty and staff of that program, this particular program, there's really strong connections between the faculty and their students. And uh, they were right at a point in the time in the semester where they were working the most intensely together when this happened. Um, so again, another, I think, I think I made the right decision. I mean, it was proved out right away again where Okro came in and they actually were awesome. They actually did debriefing sessions for both just students, but they also offered the debriefing sessions for our staff and faculty. And I still get emails from some of those staff and faculty telling me how much of a positive impact that made and how helpful that was in terms of just moving forward and kind of healing and learning to cope with this tragedy that really took everybody by surprise. Um, again, I was so happy to hear that feedback because I don't think I heard a single negative thing about it from anybody, student or staff or faculty alike. And going forward, that's definitely part of our policy and our protocol now when there is a um, campus tragedy like that. One of our first phone calls we make are going to be to Dennis and the Okro organization. So Dennis, thank you so much for everything you do and everything your team does. I'm etern eternally grateful to you all. How does that make you, you feel, Dennis? <laughs> how does that make you feel, Dennis, to hear how your program has helped? <laughs> it chokes me up. <laughs> it chokes me up that uh, we can have that, that type of an impact, but uh, that's what we're here for. It's just we don't hear it very often. Okay, well, and, and that's, the, that's the main thing too, and that's why we said we have to make sure that we thank you, you know, and, and give you your flowers for doing so much, so much work. Um, and, and of course, David, you know, I know that we do have another guest that we want to talk about this, but thank you so much for coming on and for letting us know how much Okro means. If you were to give a recommendation, what would you, what would you tell other people about Okro? Oh, I would tell them, first of all, I want as many people to know about Oak Grove as possible because it is just a absolutely wonderful resource that we have in our community. And just, I'm sure, like a lot of our resources, not enough people know about it, right? Um, but without any hesitation at all, I would absolutely recommend this for any, my, my rule of thumb is if, if you think this could be helpful, then it can be helpful. Go ahead and reach out the call. Don't even struggle with that decision because I don't see it ever being potentially a bad decision. And knowing that there's a team of people out there who can come in and help either you and your staff, wherever you're working, or the people that have been impacted by a tragedy, it's just so nice to know that's out there. And I wish more people knew about it. And I would absolutely encourage anybody who's even thinking about reaching out, make that call and reach out to them. All right. Thank you so much, David and Dennis. Dennis, stay on. We're going to get one more person in after this break. Thank you. Thank you. Hello and welcome back to this Orient Outreach Okro edition. I'm joined by Karen Asaf and once again, Dennis Jones, who is the president of Okro. Thank you so much for joining us, Karen. How are you today? I'm good. How are you, Stacey? Doing very well. Talk to me about your first experience with Okro. How did you, how did you know about it? My shift leader at the time with the department I was with uh, was a member of it. And I had had a particularly difficult call that I was handling in the room while she was in there with me. And she pulled me off my console for a few minutes so that I could pull myself together and then decided that it was best for me to join in a care meeting with her team members and other members of our two departments that were involved in this call. I was very hesitant Initially, I don't like to share, uh, I don't share very well with difficult situations, but she gave me two choices. She said I could drive myself to the meeting or she would come pick me up and get me into her car and take me. So that's how I was first introduced to it. And how long ago was that? Oh my gosh, it's been about eight, nine years. It was a while ago. Okay, and do you continue to use some of the steps that they've given you? I did, I do. Um, I'm no longer in the profession. I took early retirement last year, okay. but I was in the profession for almost just shy of 19 years. So you were part and of dispatch? I was, okay. 911 dispatcher, yes. 
uh, for our two departments. And I did. I did continue to remember and use some of what I took away from that. And my shift leader at the time continued to ask me over the next several years, if I had to do it again, would I? And I absolutely would. It was far more beneficial than I could have ever imagined. So as far as recommendations, that's, that's a pretty stellar um, recommendation there. I would, I would. There is something to be said for sitting in a room with other members of your team um, that had a different perspective of the incident. And there is something to be said for sharing what you were going through in your own little cubicle as opposed to what they were going through. And it was very helpful to me to find out that they had no clue uh, what I was dealing with in the room while they were on scene. And it had quite an impact on them as well. And so we do have Dennis, who's also part of this. Um, did Dennis mm -hmm. help you specifically? Was he part of that team that helped you? I believe he was. Um, it's been a yes, long time, but I believe Dennis was actually the one that was sitting right next to me and kept putting a hand on my arm uh, because I probably looked like I wanted to bolt out of the room a few times. It was a, it was a difficult position to be in, but very, so, so worthwhile. I can't even express what it did for me. How does that make that you feel, was Dennis? A, that, that was a very emotional time. But through her incident, her personal incident, dealing with some other things that pertain to the one she was going through, when I started talking about how that happens and interacts with people, you could almost see the light bulbs coming on <laughs> different people. It was that powerful. Yeah. So what you said and how you said it helped so many others. Mm -hmm. Yes. It wasn't just me. No, I, <laughs> it was quite a moment. It was quite a moment in that room. And I'm, I'm forever grateful that my shift leader, and she is still a member of your team, but that my shift leader dragged me there. She dragged me. Uh, yep. She was going to bring people to my home and drag me out of the house <laughs> if she had to. But I'm, I have always, always been very, very grateful that I took part in that. And not to put you on the spot, Karen, do you think that you would ever maybe become one of the volunteers of, of Okra? You know, I, I'm actually no longer in Michigan. I took early retirement and I'm now in Texas. Oh, and I forgot but, to mention congratulations on that, by the way. Congratulations on your thank retirement. You. Thank you. Thank you very You're much. Um, but yes, if I had an opportunity to be a member of a team here that could go in and sit with people and talk to them and help them work their way through the mental trauma and what a dispatcher can envision, um, I, I would absolutely do it in a heartbeat. Wonderful. There's teams down there. Okay. There, yes, there are. There are indeed. Okay, well, on that note, I do want to thank you both um, for coming in as well as David. I think that um, the work that you do is tremendous and it's definitely, um, you know, it's definitely worthy of all of our respect. So thank you so much. Um, we're gonna put a number on the screen so that people who are interested in um, contacting Oakland County Crisis Response Organization has that number and we're hoping that it reaches a lot of people so that you, they can get the help that you got. So thank you both so very much. Dennis, once again, thank you for everything that you do. And Karen, thanks for joining us, as well as David. David joined us as well. So thank you so much. That'll do it for this edition of Orient Outreach. I'd like to thank all of my guests for joining us. And if you need any support at all through Oak Grove, please contact the number listed below. That number is 248-858-0931. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.